Okay, friends, so the last days we've been discussing primarily about the living process and to actually try to the development of mindfulness, tune our attention into and to understand what that actually means and to understand what uh, awareness means. Now, you know, usually in the, in the Buddhist teaching, the word awareness as such is not mentioned too much. It's always mindfulness, mindfulness, the practice of mindfulness. But the word awareness is uh, not uh, used that often directly, or at least in a translation. Uh, you know, in the Theravada teachings. <clears throat> but the way that I like to uh, break that down is that, you know, mindfulness is the, you know, initial practice where you you try to be mindful. So, you know, you're mindful of, you know, stretching out your arms so you don't knock over a glass of water. You're mindful of going to speak some bad words or, mindfulness of uh, you know basically your your actions and in the beginning stages there there's still the sense of i behind you know i am practicing mindfulness and, and the sense that you are doing these things in mindfulness <clears throat> but when I, at least when i use the word uh, awareness it's a uh, it's kind of a, a transition of mindfulness, an advanced degree of mindfulness, where mindfulness uh, becomes sort of automatic. And there's no need for an eye to make effort at being mindful. It becomes awareness, which is sort of the underlying essence of the consciousness. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> so we've been talking about how to, how to develop mindfulness and awareness. And so we're going to start transitioning to, to reflect on, try to understand uh, depth. Because awareness of living and dying. So, you know, life and death are like two sides of a coin. You can't have one without the other. You can't die unless something was living. And you can't live without death, because that's the nature of all living uh, organisms. And they die because they, they spring from a cause. This was, you know, is the essential of the teachings of the Buddha. And that Something is born, it lives a certain amount of time, some, uh, in case of a human being, you know, some years, uh, animals, you know, some insects only, you know, live uh, a few days before they die. But anyway, birth and death are like two sides of a coin. And death shouldn't be seen as something unusual. Now, in this country, death is, you know, tried to be avoided. And the correlate, old age and death. You know, people don't want to uh, talk about that too much. So whenever people, you know, get old, they, they, you know, put them in an old age home. You know, kind of out of the public eye, so to speak. Or whenever we notice our own body, when you turn 40, you know, your eyes start going bad. And, your other organs, uh, you know, start uh, giving trouble, uh, and that process of old age comes. The people they want to hide it, right? They think, oh, old age, you better hide that. That's why in most advertisements and so on, you see that, you know, that you mostly have young people in the advertisements in order to lure people, customers, and so on. Nowadays, of course, they, they do have some old people. Uh, in that, but uh, 
for the main part, people are trying to hide or cover up the idea of aging. When people are looking in the mirror, you turn 40 for that first gray hair, you know, run to the, the pharmacy and get some hair color. Or, uh, you know, the cosmetic surgery, you know, starting to get wrinkles and, and plastic surgery and all these things try to hide this idea of old age, like it was something bad. And that's what creates fear in people's minds because of this uh, conditioning of society to think that, you know, by the time you reach old age, you're worthless. And, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, so death should be seen as something natural. And it shouldn't really be feared. And, you know, there, there are 8 billion people, well, 7 or 8 billion, what, what's, the, what's the number now, you, uh, you AI people, you know, what's the current population of the, the Earth, you know, a couple of years ago it was 5 billion, I think it's 7 billion now, whatever. And if you break that down, you know, it, it turns into, you know, million, a million or more people are dying every year. Even many thousands of people are dying almost every minute, you know, around the world. And people die from every conceivable kind of cause. And actually, death is the only thing certain in life. Because life is not certain. Some babies don't even get out of the womb before they die, do they? I mean, is it? You don't like to talk like that, but it's a reality. Babies die one day out of the womb. And in, in every increment from two days, three days, to 10 years, 50 years, to 100 years, even longer, people are dying at any possible time. But even though death is certain, the time of death is not certain. And the place that we die is not certain. And how we die is not certain. Those are the three uncertainties connected with in death. And even young people die. We read it all the time, you know, athletes dying of a heart attack on a football or basketball court or so some other, so many other ways. So there's different ways one can die. You can reach old age. So the natural lifespan of a human being is said to be about 80 or maybe 90 now. My mother lived to 102, actually, which was you know, a, uh, not so common, but it's getting more common. But, you know, the uh, lifespan is being uh, advanced because of medicine and so on. But And people generally die according to uh, the common. You know, every being is unique. There's not two people, even twins or triplets or quadruplets, that are absolutely identical in every uh, single aspect. They might have identical features, but even using identical twins, there's some little thing that you can identify with. But mentally, they're different. So of all these 8 billion, 8 billion people on the planet, you know, there's no two, everyone's going to die in different circumstances, even within a family, the same family. Father died, might die 20 years before the mother died. Sons and daughters might die before even the parents died. Because it's unpredictable. And that unpredictability you know, causes fear and anxiety. In people and now with the uh, the geonome, what do they call it? Nomi, the geonome, you know, the, the idea of genes, right? So, you know, if your parents had uh, some sicknesses and they had the genes for you know various kind of debilitating sicknesses, people are now willing and they're wanting to submit their DNA to get a test to see if they're susceptible because they, they get scared. You're worried. <clears throat> you 
in with the, you know, the rapid, the wars and the crimes and the people are, so many people are dying. So we shouldn't see death as anything unusual. But when somebody gets a pronouncement from the doctor saying, oh, that test you got, you know, I'm sorry, you know, we got six months to live. Oh. Why are people afraid of death? Well, everybody's going to have their own uh, reasons. Usually it's because they're, you know, they desire to live. And why do you want to live? I already mentioned that before. Maybe to complete your bucket list to see your kids graduate from uh, college and any number of reasons. Or maybe you just, the fear of death, not knowing the, what lies beyond. So I want to kind of explain, probably a lot of you already know, uh, how many people have heard the term samsara? Maybe quite a few. And you know, in the in the uh, in contrast to some other religious theories that uh, you know a person is born and you know that the person is created by the parents and that's the first life and they're going to live one life and then die and then reach some kind of paradise or eternity. There's some different beliefs about what happens after death. But according to the Eastern religion, especially Buddhism and Hinduism, uh, that you know the mind continues after death, the consciousness. Because as I mentioned in yesterday's talk about conception, and that at the moment of conception, the life force of consciousness, the spark of consciousness, the life force comes from a outside of the mother and father and joins into that uh, new little being and then the process of life continues so and so the idea about the the rebirth is uh has been an ancient uh, you know uh, some people call it a belief but for you know people like the buddha and other buddhists you know it's, it's a reality but anyway, I'm not going to argue that point. But uh, anyway, the theory about the sansaras, these minds have been going through the rounds of birth and death since what is called beginningless time. There's no exact point in time, billions, billions, or trillions of years ago, when the first <laughs> consciousness arose or the, the first uh, being arose and started populating uh, the world. Now, of course, certain religions have a nice sterilized idea of how that occurs, you know. In seven days, somebody created the world and put man and woman on the earth and everything happened. Okay, well, we don't, you know, that may be true, maybe not the truth. But according to the Dhamma, uh, you know, this process has been going on since the beginning of this time. Because the Buddha said, he could remember his past lives because of his, the power of his mind after he attained enlightenment. The power of his mind was so powerful. He could penetrate back to the unconscious mind and he was trying to find out, uh, you know, where his, his previous birth was. And he went back one life, two life, ten life, hundreds of lives, thousands of lives, even hundreds of thousands of lives he could remember going back and then all kinds of different beings. I mean, been an, as an animal, as a human being, and a deva, a king, and almost every possible uh, manifestation. And he kept on going back and he couldn't find the exact beginning. He said, enough. It doesn't matter when it began. The thing is that how it's continued. And he saw that every life, the next life was conditioned by that previous life, the kind of karma that he accumulated. And that went on and on and on. He could see that link. But it wasn't the same person. It was a continuity of consciousness and accumulated memories uh, that was being sort of passed on from 
life to life. And you saw how it was a kind of an evolution. Uh, now, whether you believe that or not, of course, it's up to you, but uh, it, uh, it makes more sense to life. What is the purpose of life? Uh, that idea that uh, basically our life is a, is a gradual evolution and evolving. And each life is seen to be like uh, each life we're born to learn a lesson. Learn the lesson about uh, kindness, about selflessness, about non-greed, about non-hatred. And the, uh, developing our mind and consciousness. So it's like a schoolroom, similar to uh, you know the school. You went from first grade, you know, up to graduation of high school. And what happened if you you failed the uh, uh, seventh grade? You have to come back and do it again. Is that anybody heard about hear about that? Yeah. 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 That happened to anybody? <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, each grade you have to pass certain. You have to gain certain knowledge. Take tests. If you fail, you have to repeat it. So the same way in the until you graduate. So the same way in the Buddhist idea about life and the purpose of life is that each life we're put here to learn lessons, to learn from our mistakes of perhaps what we did in a, in a past life. And how we were born in our life, what, how it was affected uh, you know, in this life. And if we don't learn those lessons, then we have to get uh, the mind and get reborn again to carry on its, uh, its evolution. And karma is actually an evolution theory. A lot of people think of oh, karma, that's a, you get punished for your bad deeds or, if, you know, if, like we were talking about before, the, the law of cause and effect thing, like, uh, you know, so if you, Newton's law. Uh, a lot of people see it as like a punishment or reward. And kind of, in a way, it kind of is, but it, it's uh, not exactly that way. But uh, it's, a, it's an evolutionary tool. That means you keep on doing things over and over, let's say, uh, bad habits. And then you, you keep you getting in trouble for it. You're getting burned by it. And some people just keep on doing that their whole life until they either get murdered or executed in prison or just uh, die in a prison cell or die a little lonely in some uh, place. <clears throat> because they, haven't, they didn't learn their lesson. So in, in the Dharma, when we're practicing Dharma, it's about using this life to learn the lessons of living in harmony with the, with the law of karma. So living in harmony with the law of karma, now we've already mentioned that, and you, you already basically know that. And it says that if you act or speak with an impure mind, that means with greed, hatred, and delusion, then problems and suffering will come uh, back to you. Is because we're not living in harmony with the laws of nature. That means with the law of karma, we're living out of harmony. That means we're not mindful. So we do those negative actions that then bring us uh, problems. So the lesson of life is learning how to live in harmony with the law of nature uh, so our mind can uh, evolve to greater states of of happiness and, and eventually you know, the path to uh, liberation. So that's the way that, you know, from the Dhamma point of view, 
that uh, you know life the, the purpose of, of life should be you know in freeing our mind from those things that keep us trapped in the uh, love come and especially the the wheel of suffering now coming back to the actual death you know there's there's three kind of levels of death there's the lifetime to lifetime process and that's what we were kind of just talking about and how many of you have heard of the uh Samuppada, the 12 links of uh, dependent origination so that is a sort of a, a, a central uh, doctrine of the buddha to describe the second and third noble truth, the arising and continuation of suffering, and then how suffering ceases. And there's a diagram actually, how many people have, have looked at those 12 links of dependent origination? There's in that wall on the wall, just uh, you know, outside these double doors in that little ante room, there's a Tibetan uh, artwork. It's a description of the, the wheel of life. And it depicts those 12 links of dependent origination around the outside. And within that, the different realms where the mind is, is uh, reborn, according to the Kama. And it looks to be like a monster holding the wheel of life uh, in its uh, paws. And that, <laughs> that sort of monster is called the, the Lord of Death. It, you know, death is what is uh, conquering everything. Because, again, life is not certain. Uh, death is the only thing that is certain. But we shouldn't be af af afraid of it unless we've led an uncontrolled life unless we don't uh, sort of change our life then you know the things that the you know, skillful things that are done the, if your mind is still filled with you know guilt worry remorse and fear and other things these are the kind of things that are going to affect the mind when uh, the mind leaves the body and we don't know when the, when death will occur as i already mentioned because it can come very suddenly. But anyway, coming back to these, uh, so the lifetime to lifetime birth and death, it's like when, when you die, as I mentioned yesterday, it's, I don't know why people are afraid of death. You go to sleep at night, right? You can die in your sleep, right? A lot of people die in their sleep, right? And not just old people who die of a heart attack in their sleep. You know, other people die in their sleep. But, you know, it's like death. People, you know, you go to sleep at night and you wake up. Maybe in your sleep you're having nightmares or other kind of weird dreams. And, and you wake up and I'll say, oh, I'm back here. Well, death in the of the physical body is not much different than that. You think this body drops dead and the mind uh, leaves because it, uh, it can't uh, work in a, in a, you know, a, a you know, dying body. Consciousness needs a vehicle to operate through. So it leaves, it seek out another body. And so you get reborn again. And then you, you wake up, you know, Whole another lifetime. Instead of just waking up the next day, you wake up in the next lifetime. But it's, it's basically a similar process. It's only a continuity of the process that you're going through now every day of momentary death. So there's a lifetime to lifetime process of birth and death. And there's a day to day process of birth and death. It means you die at night, you go to sleep, and you wake up the next day. 
And then there's also the momentary uh, birth and death. That means from moment to moment. As I, I think I mentioned or alluded to uh, maybe before. It, uh, and I wanted to explain the nature of consciousness. So our consciousness or our mind basically is, is made up our, our what we call our life, actually. Okay, you call your life, right? What do you call your life? What is your life? It's waking up in the morning and you say, oh, I have to go to work and you feed your kids and do things and, you know, go to bridge clubs and play sports. Is that what people call life? I mean, no. <clears throat> uh, okay, so that's... <laughs> Their, their meaning of life, but as, as I already mentioned before, of course, the real life is that living process uh, within you. But, so that momentary, actually the Buddha said that what we call life are just moments of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking that are arising and passing away in a a very high speed. How many mathematicians would have here? Any of you people are math majors? You crunch some numbers real quick. 10 to the 24th power. Then it comes out to sept one septillion. If you can you know, fathom that. Or our mind is processing information faster than a, a supercomputer. Or faster than AI. Now you all know about AI, right? It works pretty fast, right? You ask it any question and it goes through the whole storage of <laughs> so many millions of computers and comes out with an answer in a couple of seconds. Well, our brain works faster than or just as fast. And <clears throat> so anyway, what we call, the Buddha gave a nice uh, discourse a group of monks. He says, monks, I'll teach you the all. And then, the all? Oh, we're listening. He says, what is the all? It's the eye and seeing. It's the ear and hearing. It's the nose and smelling. It's the tongue and tasting. It's the body and feeling. And it's the mind, uh, thoughts, memory, and so on, uh, and cogn cognition. That's the all. That's what life is. Moments of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking that are arising and, you know, that fast. So it gives the illusion uh, of a smooth flowing when we open our eyes and we see things. Uh, you know, a smooth flowing uh, picture. But actually, our consciousness is similar to a, a reel of film. You know, before digital, they had movie reels. And how is a movie reel made? So, I saw myself. I saw. Yeah, it's, it's individual frames, right? Like a picture, photograph, it's like your camera does. If you take a video, you can see each individual little frame. Okay. So, you know, for one little 10 minute uh, little movie or so on, you know, they produced hundreds of thousands of uh, individual frames. And they had a little space in between. You ever seen the old time projectors? And the, the movie was put on this projector and it was spinning in real fast, so you wouldn't see the space in between. And so it looked like you go to the movie and it looked like it was a flowing uh, scene. But actually it was made up of individual frames. So those individual frames are like the moments of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, and touching, and thinking that are arising and passing away at that supersonic uh, speed. And because our mind is slow, 
it's impossible for us to really see it. And so the illusion of uh, a solid reality uh, is created. And basically that what is what our brain does, our brain and consciousness. So each moment of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking, uh, and the mind is uh, uh, creating that kind of uh, movie. That's why I, I think I mentioned to you this morning. Try to you know uh, watch the movie of the of yourself sitting and breathing <laughs> or walking, and that, well, that's what the mind is actually doing. Uh, and the sense of self. When we talked about the baby yesterday, when it was born, it didn't have any sense of, any developed sense of self or I, I, me, or mine. The sense of I, me, or mine. I mean, how many people use I, me, or mine? How many times you say that a day? Right? Why are you saying that? Where is this I, me, or mine? Anyway. So the baby doesn't have that in the but he gets it, or she, as we already described. Uh, and so the sense of self basically comes into this, you know, arises with each moment of consciousness. You know, each time you hear something, the sense of I am hearing that arises, but then it vanishes real quickly. But another one arises instantly and a whole series arise instantly but we don't see that and the uh, sense of self appears to be a continuous but actually it's an illusion just like the, uh, the movie real the film showing a, a solid flowing scene so so basically that's what is called the momentary birth and death is that uh, moment to moment birth and death of each frame of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking that you know is arising and vanishing. But we don't see that. So the illusion that our ego, our self, is something real is uh, created. <clears throat> and so in that way, the sense of our self dies at each moment and is reborn again in the next moment. So that's the, the deeper underlying meaning of the momentary birth and death. And this is what actually we try to tune into when we're practicing mindfulness and especially the uh, vipassana method of, uh, you know, the insight meditation. Now, actually, coming back to these two words, mindfulness and vipassana, people use, are using the word vipassana a lot these days, right? Yes. Vipassana, vipassana, vipassana. Uh, but actually, you know, vipassana, you can't practice vipassana until you've developed a very high level of mindfulness and also uh, reached a level of uh, jhani concentration. Uh, but anyway, there's, you know, people are going to argue that point. But <clears throat> because vipassana is sort of like high octane mindfulness. We practice mindfulness, but because most people have hindrances, they're only mindful, you know, they're not continually mindful. You know, they get mind, mind wandering, you know, they drowse out and come back, and they, you know, it keeps being interrupted by various thoughts. So that's a very low level of mindfulness. But when you gain the, the one pointed concentration, when you tune into the flow of the present moment, then that mindfulness uh, becomes more unbroken. Uh, and then that's when you would, could call it really being a vipassana. 
in seeing reality as it is. Actually, the word vipassana means seeing reality as it is. And how is it? How is reality as it is? Imperfect, we just talked about. That means it's constantly changing moment by moment. And even this idea about the, the rebirth in your life. You've been reborn many times. You say, are you the same child you were when you were five years old? And you say you're the same person? And you say this, you're the same person even from last year? Because you might have learned something. You might have, you know, every single experience that we've had our whole life has changed us in one way or another. Every conversation we've had with somebody, anything that you studied, you know, the mind would make, can change its directions many times, very unexpectedly. Something could happen and, and change your whole life. So in that way too, we were undergoing you know, birth and death, and the life is a, I mean, a continual process of change. Now there is a continuity, but it's not, you can't say it's the same person that was reborn, but you can't say it's altogether totally a different person. Uh, anyway, that's the way we normally try to, you know, and like as people, you know, ask all the time, is the same person reborn? You know, when they're reborn, is it the same person? It's not the same person, but it's not altogether different because there is that continuity of consciousness, but it's, it's not a, uh, some kind of a permanent entity. Anyway, I don't want to you know, make it sound too complicated. But, uh, so <clears throat> that those different uh, ways of understanding the death process so when you understand that the mind is undergoing birth and death at every moment, and that death of the physical body is just, as I've already mentioned, it's like uh, taking off the old set of clothes and putting on a new uh, set of clothes and uh, you know going back out to your house. Uh, so that's why when you understand it like that, uh, it's you know, it's uh, you know not so scary. Uh, but of course, it's you know this is not so cut and dried and uh, simple and like that either. But you know it's very difficult to explain. But the main uh, point is that you know uh, living with uh, you know. Living and dying with awareness is that we have to, if you live with awareness and up to the point of death, as I mentioned, the, for Buddhists, the ego death is the ultimate uh, death. And the person who attains enlightenment, like the Buddha or Arahants, it is said that they've already gone beyond death. So somebody like the Buddha or Arans, when they, you know, they, they die before the physical body dies. That means they reach ego death. And momentary birth and death because their mind is fully established in the present moment awareness. There's no more, you know, birth and death of uh, ego consciousness. And so they've reached what is called the deathless state. So that's why people who reach that level, they're not afraid of death because death mean, death of the physical body means nothing. Uh, anyway, that's, you know, difficult for people to understand. But through the practice of meditation, when you get when you eventually are able to develop a, a more continuous flow of awareness from moment to moment. And that's why, you know, the, the 
probably the only way or the best way to do that is is with the body, the mindfulness of the body. Because you can't do it with any other things hardly at all, because you can't control them. But you know, because the whole world is coming through our mind and nervous system. That's why when you meditate, actually, when you reach a level of awareness, it's really like you're watching a movie of life. It's like taking a balcony seat in the theater and just watching your body sitting and breathing, watching it tripping out with so many different thoughts. Watch it to, you know, get angry, you know, you know, but you're kind of just chuckling. <laughs> stupid, stupid mind, you know. You're able to chuckle, laugh at yourself. You're walking on mindfully and then, you know, not watching what you're doing and stub your toe or trip over something and fall down. Laugh. Don't curse and blame the person who put the rock there. Blame your unmindfulness. So whatever happens to you, everybody wants to put blame on others. No okay. they? Usually. But actually, if we look inside of ourselves, most of the time it's because of, you know, the underlying cause of that problem is, you know, within ourselves. It's being unmindful or it's, uh, you know, done something to antagonize uh, somebody else. Maybe we don't even know it. Uh, and, uh, you know, so many things that uh, happen to us. Or we, you know, we get sick. <clears throat> now there's something also called the five daily recollection. And so, how many people have heard of those? Some of you don't know. The five daily recollections. So this is what the Buddha recommended. Lay people as well as monks should reflect on every day. That is, I'm of the nature to get sick. I have not, this body has not gone beyond getting sick. That's the, that's the third one. You said it's of the nature to get sick. I just my hearing. Please excuse me. I beg your pardon, sir. I'll be back in the silence. Oh, that's good. Yes. That means I have to stop speaking. Okay, please continue okay. your discourse. <laughs> Do I need to leave the room or stand in a corner? Just be quiet. Just <laughs> okay. So the five daily recollections are. You can read them in this book here. It's a little page in the book. Yeah. I'm of the nature to get sick. I have not gone beyond sick. Are any of you beyond getting sick? Look what happened in COVID, right? I'm of the nature to get disease. I have not gone, be this body has not gone beyond disease. Is anybody beyond disease? Third one is, I'm in the nature to die. I have not gone beyond death. And the fourth one is, everything dear and delightful to me will change and vanish. So don't be surprised when a hurricane blows your house away or a robber comes and steals something or you, you know, children die in a motor accident or get murdered or I mean, people can die in every single conceivable way. We shouldn't be surprised when it happens. Because you were born with a deck of cards, a stacked deck of cards. That you could die in any possible conceivable way. You were born with that possibility. And so, you know, when it happens, you shouldn't be surprised. The fifth one is, and then I'm the owner of my comma, heir of my comma, 
were born of my karma, I'm the heir of my karma. Everything that I do, good or bad, I will be, I will inherit that result. So those are the, you know, the realities of life that the Buddha's had us reflect on over and over. So we don't get curious. That's the main thing. And there's there's a simile of the uh, the four thoroughbred horses. How many people have heard that simile? The four horses. In terms of how people regard their life and how they deal with, you know, these things like old age and death. So there's a farmer who had a house on a hill. And he had a barn down below. And he had four horses, work horses, there in the barn. So the farmer comes out in the morning, five in the morning, you know, and then he, you know, he has a screen door, a little farmhouse, right? And the screen doors. Then he slams the screen door, and the wind blows it shut. And, one of those horses wakes up and says, oh, my master's coming now. Let me get up and get ready for work. And the other three keep sleeping. And then the farmer has to go down to the actual barn and he starts opening the old creaky, you know, rusty hinged uh, wooden door on the barn, you know, making noise, squeaking, creaking noise. Then the second horse wakes up. Oh, my master's here now. Let me get ready for work. The other two keep sleeping. So then the, fa the farmer has to go into the barn, and you know, there's chains and stuff on one of the pillars inside the barn, right? Goads and chains, and so they use for working. So he starts rattling these chains to get a goad down from the hook. Then the third horse jumps up, oh, my master is here, let me get ready for work. And the fourth one keeps sleeping. So then the farmer has to actually take the goad and jam it into the ribs of the horse. Only then does the horse, oh my gosh, <laughs> and uh, jumps up. And so this is how a lot of people go through life, not thinking about uh, sickness, old age, and death that w will happen to them. And then when it happens, they say, why me? I've done all the right things. Why am I getting this disease? Why, you know, why am I getting COVID? They didn't get COVID. So, uh, it, well, let's use a more contemporary, let's use COVID as an example. That's a, that's a more contemporary thing, right? You've all been around for the last five years, right? You know what happened with COVID. First, it was a Chinese disease, wasn't it? You know, we were hearing about these people in China getting, you know, dying by the masses. And they're all wearing masks. You know, nobody here thought about it. I was never going to come over here. But then first couple of cases started happening in Washington State, if you know how all that came about. I don't know. And now it's in America. It's like, oh, it's not going to spread. You know, they're going to they're going to find a vaccine. It's not going to spread. And you know, we don't have to wear masks. You know, so people were complacent, and then it started creeping and <laughs> spreading. You know, across the states, and then it comes to your own city, or maybe your state. Now people in in your, whatever state you're in, are getting infected and dying. But still, you might say, no, nah, I'm not going to get it, you know. People are in denial. And then one of your own family members gets stricken. And these are like the th thoroughbred horses. Uh, and then you still think, oh, only when it started coming to people's cities, then people started, oh, maybe, maybe I wore a mask. Maybe I better stay six feet away. Right? 
but they keep on, you know, denying until it's creeping up to the doorstep. Until finally, the, the, you yourself or that person, you know, got stricken with the COVID and was dead within five days. So that's like those four horses, the person that, that waits and, or the person that just hears that they're, oh, the, you know, the first case that came to America, okay, immediately they get a mask and they, they start uh, practicing distance and, and other things like that and not going in public. Or any way to prepare themselves. Uh, and so the same way with learning to uh, meditate. Because we don't know when death can come at any time. We need to prepare now, even though we don't want to die. No one wants to die, right? But even despite that, millions of people die every day all around the world from so many different causes. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so the, the life basically should be a preparation for death. Because life is uncertain if we delay practicing meditation and say, oh, I'll retire, then I'll go on my first retreat. How many people have heard that? <laughs> or how many of you even, you had the idea to meditate maybe some years ago, but you put it off for a long time, and maybe it was a, a year or two or more before you actually went on your first retreat or went to your first yoga class or your first meditation class. Anybody that happened to? Only one or two? No. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, so uh, because again, we don't know when we'll die, so we need to work on uh, developing our awareness and you know changing our purifying our karma so that we uh, don't die with guilt, worry, remorse, and fear. Because dying. If your mind has guilt, worry, remorse, and fear in it when you die, that's a that's a, a bad omen, according to the the idea about rebirth. Because the mind will then be attracted to a place where it will encounter more guilt, worry, remorse, and fear, or conditions that will keep generating that. So that's why. You know, the urgency, the sort of spiritual urgency to practice, even while you're still young, uh, to practice uh, the Dhamma and not think that I'll oh, wait until I'm older or retire because you might not even reach that level. I mean, not reach that point. So that is, again, one of the, the meanings of living and dying with the awareness that we. Uh, if you live with awareness and you develop, you know, mindfulness and develop awareness to a, a good level where, uh, you know, you're no longer being, uh, at least, you know, creating bad karma. You have that awareness where you're quick enough to check your negative thoughts or check your negative actions and, uh, you know, developing uh, more uh, expanded uh, awareness, or even to the point of seeing through the, you know, illusion of the ego. Now, in meditation practice, you can come to a point. See, the sense of self is made up of just the past and the future, and pleasure and pain. Pleasure and pain is directly connected to the past and the future, because we're hoping for pleasure in the future, and we're trying to avoid pain that had come to us in the past for that pain to come to us again in the future. And that our whole sense of self is wrapped around that. And that's why when you, you know, develop mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom, you develop, which is basically developing that flow of present moment awareness, where you're tuning in to just, you know, seeing how quickly things are just arising and vanishing. 
Actually, let, let me ask you, because I mentioned it this morning. How many people would I kind of mention it, you know, to see how quickly you can notice, you know, sensations or sounds kind of just arising and vanishing? Anybody is able to maybe notice anything, one or two things? Did it even surprise you how quickly it just you know, arose and vanished? <clears throat> so in Vipassana, actually, the what is called the, the skill in Vipassana, or the trick of Vipassana, is to speed up the ability to notice more and more things. So it's kind of the, anti, the opposite of holding your mind on one particular object. But tuning into the flow of awareness is there's no one object. The flow of awareness is the, is the one point of this in the present moment. And you, you you build up the ability to notice, you know, uh, many, many hundreds, even thousands of things uh, arising and vanishing you within the space of a, a few seconds or at least a minute or two. But the more things you can notice arising and vanishing, the mind doesn't have any time to hold on to any particular one. Therefore, the past and the future connected with those objects vanishes and so does uh, by, by that time the feeling of the body also would have kind of uh, you know vanished and become very light and the sense of self starts to to fade away the sense of the ego starts to fade away that's an advanced level of insight uh, you know, there's three levels of insight. We call it the anicca, dukkha, and anatta. So anicca is the easiest insight to, to understand. Because we can understand how things are changing. These, all these material things, objects can change and vanish. And then we can understand how our mind is changing quite fast. And the things that we hear and uh, feel. And then you can, because of seeing impermanence, you see how trying to hold on to things that are going to change brings a disappointment. And you can't rely on anything to be a stable source of happiness. Not your new Mercedes Benz or your new house or even uh, your mates and so on. Because it's all beyond our control. And, and then the third one is that because things are impermanent and they can't be controlled, how can we call it myself? You know, there's no I or controller that actually can control it yet. So these are the insights that you get. Uh, and you get that by observing this, you know, this movie of the body and mind, this ability to hold that attention in that flow of uh, awareness. Anyway, uh, I think uh, that might be enough uh, for this talk because we covered a lot of ground. But I just keep repeating these things because uh, people tend to forget. Uh, and so the more you hear of things in the meditation, you remember. Oh, yeah. Keep your mind, you know, focused on, on the, you know, on that flow of impermanence, or at least developing your, you know, concentration. Okay, so uh, you know there's already a lot of leftover questions from last night, so try not to write so many questions tonight. I mean, you can write some, but I'll never get through them. You know, there are two more days, but uh... okay. So. Uh, uh, okay, now let's take a deep breath. Close your eyes, try to cut off all that outward uh, outward focus. Take a deep, slow breath, hold the air in your lungs as long as you comfortably can. Just bring that attention into the body. Just 